Outrocast. Hey, Kurt, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm going to turn you up just a little bit here. Sure. Okay. Are, so, are you uh, dialing in from Austin? Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm west of Austin. I'm in an area called Dripping Springs. Got it. When did you go to Austin and decide the, that the Wisconsin cold was too much for you? <laughs> uh, it was around uh, 97 that I moved here, um, and it was just supposed to be temporary, just hang out here for a while, but uh, because the cost of living here was really great, you know, your dollar here went really far, and sure. uh, now it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're always looking for that great next city, and then that next city everyone realizes is the great next city, and then you have to find the next next great city, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I guess so. Austin was, uh, <clears throat> it was always great, you know, I started coming here in the 80s when we were touring and right. I always liked it here a lot and the musical community and stuff. So um, I felt good here, but it was nice because it used to be a more of a secret, mm -hmm. you know, and now it just it became the destination. Well, fortunately, you're somewhere where you can still track drums and play all the instruments on your album. Here on Long Island, you can't track drums in your house unless you just invest a lot of money into soundproofing. So your new album for the last time, you played all the instruments. You did pretty much everything except the mastering. Did you know outright that it was going to be a DIY project like that? No, I mean, I, I, <clears throat> I've... Uh played a lot of the instruments on most of our records throughout time, but uh, I prefer when it's more of a band, um, when you can do that. It's just because of the pandemic and everything. And right. it just kind of went that way. And I could have sent out tracks more probably, but I just, you know, I just was chipping away at it here at home and stuff. And before I knew it, it was kind of done. And I thought I should just, you know, I meant to get it out in 2020, but the pandemic hit. So I did, I shelled it for a year and I just thought I should just get this out now. So I just mixed it up and, and it was done and I thought I should get it out, but I didn't really plan it that way, no. Hmm. When you're tracking drums for you, is it the kind of thing where you do that first and you're singing the song in your head or do you do the rough drums, track everything and then retract the drums? Um, I've always, since the beginning, since even before, when we were a local band in Waukesha, Wisconsin, I would go in and just sing the song and play the drum part. Um, and I've, and I kept doing that, you know, throughout, throughout the years, I would just, uh, you know, even in like on Idaho, our fifth record, same thing, I would go in and just sing the song and, and I'd walk back in and put a rhythm guitar to it and bass and keyboards or whatever we were doing to kind of build it up. And then we would sing on it and you would. I guess um, it would have a basic feel on it because that's what I was singing in my head at the time when I played the drums, you know, and, and a basic tempo and stuff that felt right. And so we, I just got used to doing it that way. I was this musical person. And so we just developed that way for a lot of years. And so when it came to me going on with Bodines in later years, it was the same process. of this is what I would always kind of did. Right. People who read up on you know that you started off as a drummer and then you evolved into more of a person in the front. That intrigues me because do you hear the music when when you're in other words, do you hear it first and then you track it on the instrument? You know, where where are the drums in the process of all that? Um <laughs> yeah, the drums are always kind of my first thought, you know, um, because I I love rhythm so much and it, it's really I felt um, one of my biggest strongest gifts as a musician is rhythm timing mm -hmm. and so I, I, I it's difficult for other drummers in the band because I'm so sensitive to timing but um, we, we've learned how to work with it and stuff now but yeah to answer your question that's what I was always listening to as a kid and that's that's where it all kind of starts with me and um, this stuff was different in that the last few records were songs I did for the a Netflix show called The Ranch, which mm -hmm. they didn't want a lot of drums on stuff because they had so much dialogue going on. So it really presented more of a challenge for me to, to come up with ideas. Over 70 songs on The Ranch, did I read that correctly? Somewhere in that range, yeah. I, I, didn't, I haven't officially counted, but um, there were eight seasons and I have 
one or two musical pieces in each episode. So it was a lot. That's kind of a saving grace in a way because publishing money, not just from the, the money aspect, but that super keeps you relevant. You know, I say that because a lot of times when somebody has something really successful in the 80s or the 90s, that's always in the parentheses next to their name. And at a certain point you go, oh, what else have they done? Like, for example, if you're talking about the cast of Seinfeld and they're still talking about Seinfeld in 2022, you go, <coughs> enough, what have you done? It must be cool yeah. to have a real tentpole credit like that in the 2020s. Yeah, no, it's great. It, it you know, it's kind of like I've seen do so many different mediums for releasing music come through and go, you know, yeah. Netflix was another new one in the age of streaming and stuff. Netflix became not just a streaming thing. It wasn't streaming just music. It was streaming movies and shows, but yet they used music. And so it was in effect that you were working with streaming a, a new format. And I was really lucky that the producers of this show, um, Don R Reno Rio and Jim Patterson were like big fans of the band since the start and so they were really great and they basic their direction was write as much stuff as you can we're going to try and put as much of it in the show but make sure they're complete songs so that's what that was the only tough part is a lot of times when you write music for shows you can write 30 second snippets of something mm -hmm. there and be done with it they wanted complete songs out of me and so that that made it a lot bigger of a project and speaking of new media you're a podcaster yeah, uh, that means you keep up with the times, whether or not you try to yeah. uh, podcasting. Is that something that you hope to do for years to come? I wouldn't mind it. I do like talking to people and I like hearing their stories. Um, and I've always liked kind of like talk radio and and that. That aspect of hearing stories uh, about different people and or things that are going on in the world. My daughter asked me to do it. I never thought of myself as you know, doing it myself, but she worked in podcast companies and stuff. And she suggested I do it. And I didn't want to just come out and talk about music. I wanted to do it where I could talk about creativity in the world. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's at the core of everything, but we don't talk about it enough. And, and so I thought this is a good place I could go and talk to all kinds of people about how they follow intuition and did something creative for their story you know and you just keep bringing that to people over and over and over and um my hope is that eventually in this world we'll realize that how valuable creativity really is to everything we do and so i'm excited about it so kind of recapping the things that i've mentioned here you are your own cottage industry at this point where <laughs> bodines pop up new album it's all you a TV thing pops up every now and then that's super lucrative. There's the podcast. It's this, we want Kurt. They come <laughs> for Kurt. You don't have to be anybody else. <laughs> they, they specifically come for what you give. When did you kind of realize that you were going to be okay on that end as opposed to, oh, I better have a single that gets on the radio so that way people pay attention? Um. I think I had to grow up and get a lot older for one to, to realize that um, it was difficult when we were on Warner Brothers, because when you're with a major label, that's just part of the business. If you're not right. getting your music heard, you're not really relevant to them and they have no reason to be working with you. So it's just kind of an aspect of it. And um, as you get older and you're not on major labels anymore and, and everything's changed for how music is released now. so. Um, I think people are allowed to think that way more. However, you know, you won't necessarily get any attention for your music. You, there's a lot more ways to release music and get heard and do your own thing. But um, years ago, not, not that long ago, but years ago, I heard a saying from someone who was an actress saying how she had heard from an older actress, and I, I have forgotten her name, but she said the same thing of a uh, she said, the moment you care, you're done, basically. The moment you give a fuck, you're, you're done. And she was talking about art, you know? And I think yeah. that really resonated with me about it, it too. It, it, if you're going to care what someone else thinks, you're going to, you're done. You're kind of, now you're doing mediocre stuff because you're chasing someone else's idea. So um, 
it's really important, I think, if you're doing any kind of art to just kind of follow some sort of inner voice or some idea you have about it, because otherwise you're done, you know, you, you're not, what are you doing? Then you're shooting in the dark, you know, and, and not in a good way, really. So I got older, I keep that in mind now, and, and I try to do that with everything. It's, it's hard, it's hard to find, you know, when you're working all alone, it's really hard. When you're in a room of people, it's easy to bounce ideas off. And that's one nice thing that was really nice about working with Netflix is they'd have like, you know, 50 or 100 people on a set working on a show, you know, and all these people talking to me about what they were writing and what they're looking for in the future. And it was a lot easier to, to work on music that way compared to just walking in your studio and saying, what, what am I doing today? You know, or, or this is interesting, but where is it going? I think that's a much harder job. So basically you are where you want to be if you're not caring about what the other people are telling you that you should be like. Sort of. I, I mean, I still feel real unsatisfied with life. I, and so I, I sometimes wonder if that's really important as an artist for fuel hmm. um, and stuff you want to do or, or things you want to say, messages you want to get out and stuff like that. So I, I'm still in a place of, I don't feel like I've done it. I've arrived. I've accomplished what I want to. I, I still don't have that feeling yet. So I'm still searching I'm still uh, trying to do interesting things and creative things. And uh, I don't know. I don't know if you ever get that way, you know? Where well, you... Oh, oh, 100%. And, you know, this is a random thing, but it's connected. I'm slowly writing a book about David Lee Roth. And I love Van Halen. Of course, yeah. I love non-Van Halen kinds of music, too. But yeah. David Lee Roth, the more I uh, research him, is the more I find out what an angry, dissatisfied human being he <laughs> is. And that smile is partially a defense mechanism and it's partially uh like making you uncomfortable so that you second guess yourself and i came across this interview that he did with john stewart in 94 i think that was his last album for warner brothers and around then it's kind of funny to see that like bodine's were kind of hitting their peak with warner brothers and van halen's on their way out with warner brothers but yeah. John Stewart before the Daily Show is interviewing him and says, "So you happy with the new album?" He's like, "I'm never happy. I'm never happy with the tour. I'm never happy with the album." Yeah. Uh, and he kind of needs that fuel to yeah. push him forward. And I think the name of his company is something something like uh, Laugh to Win. That's the name of his corporation. So I yeah. think a lot of people at your level are like that. Maybe, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Um, you know, I explained that to my daughter recently too, like, uh, I think a lot of artists, they wrestle with depression and stuff like that. I think that's why they ended up in music and art is, it's a therapy kind of, it's a voice. It, it somehow you, you walk into a room up to a microphone and you scream into a room, right? To like, when you really analyze it, it, it looks like you got a lot of problems, but <laughs> but people gather to to sing with you, right? Like we're all getting it out of our system, kind of. And I think that's what rock and roll was about. And when it came out, when it came about, why it frightened so many people, kind of too, because like you weren't supposed to scream out to the world about it. You're supposed to just leave it all knotted up inside. And and um, so I think a lot of artists have that that unsatisfied depression thing and that all you can really do is use that for some kind of fuel because you know if you're feeling it other people are probably feeling it too even if you've got the sad thing i don't get the self-saboteur mm -hmm. thing out of you i don't get the alex chilton no. paul westerberg thing yeah. where you go i know i'm doing great art so how do i make it more difficult for the people that's never come across in your career no i was never that guy too and i used to work with someone who he would say, I, I'm not happy till everybody else is unhappy. And I, I, I you know, I, I'm not that way at all. I, I get really, you know, I struggle with depression like a lot of artists do, sure. but I, I want to use that to help lift up, you know, lift myself up, lift other people up, you know, some kind of positivity. Cause that's what I always got out of music myself when I listened to it, but I was never one of those, I need to, you know, destroy everything and everybody type person. Well, two questions, and then I'm going to let you go. And the first is, when I go down the accomplishments that you've had in your career, from a simplistic commercial perspective, you go, okay, so that guy has had a song that 
hundreds of millions of people have heard and he's been on the road with big artists and he's done it at a high level for almost 40 years because Bodine's go back to the early 80s. Yeah. What is there that you're still hoping to do or accomplish? Do you have that kind of list or is it really one day at a time, one album at a time? Yeah, I think so. I don't have, I don't have a, 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 a necessarily a bucket list. I've, um, I like to explore more into arts and art work and stuff like that and mm -hmm. have more time to do that kind of stuff in my life for sure. Um, but I'm still really, I still really love playing music a lot. Like uh, some people get to this point where they just don't like it anymore and stuff, but I really do. And I really enjoy, I pick up the guitar every day and play because I like it. You know, it, it gives me some lift. And I, when we're out doing shows and you can sing for people and they sing with you, it still feels like mm -hmm. there's a positive thing happening. So I still want to keep doing that for, for, as long as I can, or, or, and as long as it feels that way, you know, but I don't have like a necessary like bucket list or, or five-year plan or anything like that. I definitely enjoy approaching it more a year at a time at, at best, you know? Hmm. And the last question I have besides the ranch, do you have a TV recommendation you could pass on to me to, you know, Hey, you should start watching this show. One of those. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm probably, behind what most people watch I, you know like I hear about shows and and go watch them after everyone else has already watched them I still haven't watched Tiger King or anything like that yeah it happens but, but so no I'm not I'm not I couldn't recommend I'm watching uh, I think uh the Better Call Saul series now because you know I like Odenkirk a lot I think he's a I like his movie Nobody a lot too well I love those characters who are really kind of um the anti-hero kind of movies you know where uh you think they're just the lonesome loser type but they end up being more than that i think everybody kind of has that potential inside them and so i love that kind of character so i tend to watch movies and shows like that good taste well hey thank you for the many years of great music hope to see you live in new york in the near future yeah keep up all the great work there kurt i will thank you so much for talking to me Outro.